LBC News. We're now going to be discussing matters at COP27 uh, in Sharm El Sheikh. Let's bring in uh, right now on LBC News, Dr. Rupert Reid, climate and environmental campaigner, author of Parents for a Future, an associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia. It's great to have you on the programme this afternoon. At this stage, over the course of the first week of the summit, we're about halfway through now, aren't we? Have you heard anything that gives us reason for encouragement? Hi, David. There are a few causes for encouragement. There was a really good announcement the other day from the Secretary General about new methods to avoid greenwashing. There's going to be regulations that make it more difficult for companies to just make wild claims like we're going to be net zero by such and such a date unless they're actually doing stuff towards that. That's something positive. There was also something positive right at the start when COP27 resolved to discuss loss and damage. What that means is the damage that's being done to countries mostly in the global south, but not exclusively anymore by events that are so severe that they can't recover from them. That is finally going on to the COP agenda, although no actual money will change hands for at least a year or two. So there are some good things happening, but by and large, the bottom line is that COP27, like all COPs, frankly, before it, is miles off the pace. Uh, and there are no serious plans in place to keep the world's populations safe from the climate more than emergency. It's more than an emergency. It's worse than that. It's not going to go away. And it doesn't look like that's going to change. We've been here for coming back for 26 years now. And, you know, some of us are getting a little bit tired of the same old music, mood mu- music and the same old positive PR. Are some of these targets things like net zero? I mean, were these realistic pledges? Well, that's a a really interesting question. It depends what you mean by realistic. They certainly were incredibly ambitious. They were perfectly possible. They were perfectly possible to achieve technologically, physically. The problem, of course, has been an enormous problem of political will. And that problem is now so severe that we're in a situation where there is no plausible pathway, and the UN itself has now said this, there's no plausible pathway towards staying below 1.5 degrees of maximum global overheat. And to translate that for listeners, that's the safe agreed maximum limit for average global surface area temperature increase. And it's it's not going to happen. We're going to go through that. I think we could go through it in as little as five years. And this is really terrifying, and it's still not being admitted by most of those who are actually at COP27. Well-intentioned activists, scientists and politicians are all saying, look, we've got to keep 1.5 alive, but we're not going to make it. There is no credible route to doing so. And this is the really hard thing that that listeners need to try to come to terms with. We've been thoroughly let down. The pledges which were possible to meet some years ago, those pledges no longer are, no longer are credible to meet. And therefore we are in danger and we are moving into greater danger. And of course, we've been seeing signs of this this year, like the record breaking heat wave and wildfires in the UK. These incredible, appalling floods in Pakistan, large areas of Pakistan are still underwater as we speak. This is the way our future is going to be, and it is going to carry on getting worse and worse forever, unless and until we actually get serious about addressing this crisis with our full determination. And how much of maybe what would have been discussed this week and into next week as well in Egypt would have been impacted, of course, by the matters that are happening right now in Ukraine? Well, that's another really important question. On the one hand, of course, What we have in Ukraine is serving as a kind of gigantic distraction from many other things. It's very, very important what's happening in Ukraine. And part of the reason it's important is because Putin's power comes from the fact that he's a petro dictator. He, his power springs out of the barrel of uh, an oil drum. And what this really means is that we need to understand how these crises are all joined up. They're all really one thing. The cost of living crisis, the Ukraine crisis, the climate crisis, it's all just facets of a system 
which is out of balance, which is not keeping us safe. So really, Ukraine ought not to take our eyes away from the climate crisis. It ought to direct them more firmly towards the climate crisis. And there are very real win-wins here. If the government were to embark on a crash course of insulating British homes, for example, if it were to allow onshore wind again, which crazily has been banned now for uh, a decade or so, uh, if it were to do these kinds of things, and if it were to stop playing into the fossil fuel markets and subsidizing fossil fuels, then we would be actually simultaneously addressing the climate crisis, the cost of living crisis, and reducing Putin's power. He loves us being dependent upon international markets in oil and natural gas. And by the way, we can cannot get away from dependence on those markets uh, unless we completely nationalize uh, the oil industry and close our borders by drilling for more oil or um, getting more coal out of the ground. It doesn't make any difference to the price that is charged here. The only way forward is a renewable future and a future with much greater insulation and so forth. We've got to stop heating the sky. We've got to stop wasting energy. There is a way which can address all these crises simultaneously. Well, with carbon emissions at record highs, of course, we're looking to see something to see the curb of uh, the climate crisis. What do you really want to see then as we go into the closing stages of the summit? Well, in terms of COP27, there's one incredible thing that they could do, that they really could do it still, and and I would just love to see this. And what it is comes back to what I said before. They need to face up to reality. If political leaders were brave enough, if negotiators, if scientists were to come out and say, as myself and my colleagues have been saying for some time, as The Economist has now said, that the 1.5 safe limit is dead, then we could really get down to business. Because until people are confronted with that reality, by people, I mean everybody, including all citizens, until we really face up to that, we are not going to get serious enough about this crisis. We're going to think we can continue to outsource it, that it's someone else's problem. It's it's a problem we'll, that we'll really get to in the future. No, it's here now. It's in our faces. And it's going to get worse and worse until we level with with people and with each other. That we are we are out of our depth we are out of the safe zone that's the real game-changing thing that cop 27 could do once you face the once you face the deadly truth seriously then you're in a position to actually start to act on it and to act adequately really good to get your analysis this afternoon dr rupert reed climate and environmental campaigner author of parents for a future and associate professor of philosophy at the university of east anglia thank you very much indeed lbc news time it's half past four